the next three or four months. It'll be the end of spring when you actually present these, but you'll have some benchmarks along the way um, that I'll, I'll give you certain things you'll have to have done by certain times on what we're doing here. Uh, one thing that, that you have to be aware of, <clears throat> we get into the habit, it's not just in EMS, this, this is across the board. We get into the habit of listening to people Sometimes we respect those people and sometimes we don't, but we still listen to them, unfortunately. But we get into the habit of listening to people tell us certain things and then we don't have the tools to find out for ourselves how accurate that might be. And the more clout a particular individual has over us, the more respect we hold them in, the more we just trust what it is that they're telling us about what we need to do, and the less we investigate it for ourselves, right? From an agency standpoint, maybe that respect is earned, and maybe that respect is mandated. But for example, your training officer ends up holding a lot of respect from you, either because you feel you have to, whether or not you like them or not, because they have something over you, or because you actually really do respect them and what they're, what they're doing. Either way around it, they come and say, this is how we're gonna do something, and we often blindly accept that. And this isn't specific, as I said, this isn't specific to just paramedic. This, this happens in all aspects of life, in whatever industry that you're in, but uh, because we are talking about paramedic right now, I'm talking about training officers, for example. They'll come out and say, this is what we're gonna do, and we blindly say, okay, this is what we're gonna do. It's my protocol, so I have to do it this way. Whatever the case is. But it eliminates us sometimes from actually investigating that ourselves and really making sure that this is what we should be doing. <clears throat> it also makes it difficult when we have a paramilitary organization, hard to make changes from the bottom up, right? So, if I, and I realize that. I realize that you might go and have information that is better than the information you're being provided, and you might not have the best avenue for how to express that, that, that content to make sure that your uh, agency or your whatever you have influence of is, is being handled appropriately and your protocols are being adjusted and edited properly, that kind of thing. Um, I realize that, but that's a, that's a different topic altogether. All the first topic is how do you know what it is that you know? Right? How do you gather information and use it? Good? So I want to talk a little bit about this project, but I want to, before we get into the projects and what you're, what you're going to be doing, I want to talk about how to gather that information. Um, one problem with trying to gather original information is that it's sometimes really, really difficult to gather. Sometimes it's really hard to figure it out. So I've handed out a couple of things. One, I handed out uh, just an article on how, to, on how to read original research information that I think is pretty decent. And then I handed you two original research papers so that you can kind of see how they're laid out. One of those original research papers that I handed out to you has particular interest to you because the topic, amiodarone versus lidocaine, is of particular interest to us. Because it's talking about cardiac arrest and the use of amiodarone and lidocaine. If you're not interested in that, I don't know what to tell you other than you're in the wrong industry or in the wrong room right now. Because that should be of interest to you. We'll see you later, guys. Perfect. <laughs> one down. <laughs> the other one uh, is only of particular interest to you uh, if you're interested in women's health. And it should be of particular interest to you for another reason, um, which if you can't figure out what that re reason is yet, then we'll come back to it later. <clears throat> I have a couple of laughs, which means probably they've figured it out by now. Wait, what did you say? And the rest of you are still not figuring it out, but that's okay. 
<laughs> Noah is scouring the area looking for why this should have interest in him. <laughs> oh, I see it. It's oh, okay. Yeah. It's dawning on a few people here and there. It's hit me. And everyone else doesn't know, or they're still trying to figure it out, or they're pretending that they know because they don't want to be the ones that don't know. <laughs> don't know the name. Pretend. <laughs> <laughs> Always me. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so let me just let me just talk about the layout of original research papers, and then I'll talk about the layout of some other papers that you're going to look at as well. The layout of an original research paper um, is always the same. It'll give you a title, and the title is ridiculous. The titles of original research paper literally are like ridiculous titles about what the paper's about. <laughs> there, um, after that, it'll give you the authors of that particular uh, research. Um, the way that that works out is usually like this with a couple of caveats. Whoever is the first author written on, the, on that particular paper is usually the person, huh, now it dawns on Mark, is usually the person who, one, wrote that article, two, was the lead for the collection of most of that data, and was the person who did most of the work related to that. That'll be the first author on that. The last author, if there's more than one author, is usually the person who was of authority within that context. They're usually the person who uh, did the majority of the discussion with the first person that was in the, in the author that helped them to understand the information they were gathering, that did edits, um, and was usually the owner of whatever was going on, um, the lab that it was being used in, that kind of stuff. So the, the major person of authority. And the other authors that might, may or may not be in there are people who contributed a vast amount in some fashion to the overall project in some, in some fashion. Okay? They might be somebody who wrote portions of it. They might be um, a statistician that did um, the majority of the major and in-depth statistics that were there. Uh, it might have been somebody who um, helped collect the data and analyze the data. <laughs> Um, who's not on that particular, on those papers, would be somebody who um, helped come in during data collection and kind of helped run some of the, helped kind of collect some of that data, but then didn't do anything with the data. Everybody that's an author on a paper did something with the data, with the first person having done the majority of the work and the last person usually being the person that was in charge of everything. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, there are times in which case you might have a couple of authors that don't fit that. You might have sometimes a couple of authors who jointly did everything and were on equal standing in everything they did and they just had to select who was gonna be the first, the, the first author versus the second author and um, sometimes it came down to, yeah, I've got a whole bunch of papers so you can be first author because you need more papers or whatever the case is. Sometimes it's as silly as that. Um, but in, in general, it's what I, I just said a moment ago, right? Uh, then you'll come with, there's usually an abstract. The abstract is going to tell you, roughly speaking, what the general idea of the entire paper was about. And then it's going to have usually four sections or a combination of four sections. The first section of the paper is the introduction. And that introduction is going to give you background. It's going to tell you why the information that is in here is important. It's going to give you background. Sometimes it's background into the physiology of what's about to be discussed. Sometimes it is background that says, here's what we know before we did this project. Here's all the information we know. Um, but it's going to give you background information that leads you into understanding why it is that they did the project they did. Then there's going to be a section on methods that is going to discuss how they did what they did. The individual experiments or the individual things that they did to collect the data. What were the, the sequences of events that they took to collect all of the data? Then there's gonna be a results section and the results section should be all factual. It should just say, this is exactly what we found. There shouldn't be any interpretations 
in the, in the results section. It should just be, this is the information that we collected. Here are the statistics that we have. Here's what it is. And you pay particular attention to things that say the word significant or non-significant. Those are, those are technical terms in the context of research. Significance means that this data that we collected happens all the time, or as many times as we're saying it does based on our percentages and statistics that we have here. Non-significant means, and so if someone says, yes, this person, this went up by 5%, but it's non-significant, it means you can't say that it changed at all. Yes, we might see a trend, but we don't see that enough that we can actually say that it actually happens, okay? And then there'll be a discussion section. And the discussion section is where the authors take all the information that they gathered and they interpret that data. They interpret what they think those data meant and what they think it's gonna be used for. Good? So the discussion section is the, is the way the author believes the data shows relevance to whatever it is that they're doing. Sometimes it's, this is what we are saying these data mean. Sometimes it is saying, this is what these data uh, are gonna do for us clinically, whatever the case is. Does that make sense? The discussion section. So the trap that a lot of folks get into when they start to read original research is that the methods and the results sections are a pain in the ass. You're looking at that and it's like, P is less than point what? What the heck is this? Methods they did, uh, what? ANOVA, I, these words are, I, I don't understand these words. And it just gets, you get bogged down in it. And so what a lot of people do is they rely on the discussion. Sometimes they'll get a little bit of the background and they read the abstract. But what that does is it means that you are trusting everything that was just said in the discussion. And just because they might have done a good job of collecting data does not mean they did a good job of interpreting what those data actually meant. Does that make sense? Okay, so it is important that you read properly. For example, uh, when I read a research paper on women, physio physiology research in some fashion related to women, um, I will, when I'm reading through the methods, if I don't see in the mess, so my, most of my graduate research was all in women's health, okay? And specifically on hormones and sex hormones and the effects of sex hormones on the cardiovascular system. So if I read a research paper that talks about women's um, physiology in some fashion, and that they are saying, this thing makes a change in women like this, and I go to the methods section of their article, and they have not accounted for the menstrual cycle, I don't trust anything that's in that paper. Because if they can't tell me where the, the, the female was in their menstrual cycle, and they didn't account for that, and they didn't make sure that the women that they were testing were all in the same place within the menstrual cycle, and they weren't accounting for that, I can't trust the blood pressures they come up with, the heart rates they come up with, and the data and the interpretations they're making because the interpretations will not be correct. Because I know how much the menstrual cycle changes a female's physiology. Does that make sense? So I'll look at their methods and I can immediately, I can't immediately trust or distrust them, but I can immediately say that, well, their interpretations are gonna be skewed. Their, their data, their data is not, their data aren't gonna be accurate because they haven't, they haven't, they haven't taken care of making sure that they've analyzed what's going on with the menstrual cycle at the same time that they're coming up with these blood pressures and heart rates and everything else they're coming up with. Does that make sense? So you, you look at things like that and you look at the, the methods and go, wow, uh, they have some really cool information that they're saying in the discussion, but their methods over here are ridiculous. They, they're not comparing apples to apples. Their methods were stupid. Okay, well if their methods were stupid, then the data they collected is suspect and the interpretations they came up with aren't actually good interpretations. Does that make sense? It's things like that that get us uh, into situations where we have um, somebody believing that vaccines cause autism, right? Because somebody somewhere reads what a doctor has written 
And even years after he's been in jail for falsifying those things, we still believe it. Right? It's things like that that, that cause problems. So you have to make sure that you're approaching it correctly. So one of the articles that I gave you is just on how to approach uh, research articles in general. Um, knowing that the first couple of times you read original research, it, it's, um, it's terrible. You're like trying to get through it and you, you're not quite sure. And finally when you get to the discussion, it's almost like angels are singing because you actually can understand it. So, sometimes. So, uh, I'm encouraging you to not let that happen and make sure that you are taking the time to read all of the original stuff that you're doing. Uh, yes? Where do you find the research? The original research? Yeah. Excellent question. So, um, when, so, the, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come from that a number of different angles to get you to the right place, right? Um, but you'll note that in any paper that you read, the back, the very last portion of the, the paper are the references. And the references are always the original research that was um, read and understood before writing the paper that you're reading. Does that make sense? So if you look at if you look at Jenny's paper, if you look at the progesterone paper, some of you don't know who Jenny is yet. Two, four pages. <laughs> yeah, you've got you've got a ton of references there of everything that was put into that particular paper to make sure that you understand what it was, right? So that'll give you the title of it. You can then take the title and you can just Google it to get the title and to get the paper. And I'll tell you a couple things about that. Some of those articles are available to you and some of them are not. Some of those articles are available for free and some of them are not. So that particular article, that progesterone article, went into a journal of physiology for heart and circulation. It's one of the major um, uh, cardiovascular journals. That particular one is free. So when you look up that title, their stuff, a lot of their stuff they give you for free. So you'll be able to pull it that way. Some of the stuff isn't free. The abstracts are always something you can get, but sometimes you have to do a little bit more to get it. So a website that'll help you is a website called PubMed. PubMed is the, the website that kind of keeps track of all uh, research articles. Any, anything that's been done in research all the way back to, I don't know, 1800s. You can get off of, off of PubMed if it's available. Um, they'll, when you look up something there, uh, whatever it is that you're looking up, they'll provide you the abstracts for it and then links to where you can get the actual document. Now, to get the actual document, uh, that can be a challenge because some of them are free and some of them you have to log into journals and you can't log into journals without having a membership or paying, right? So the other thing you can do is log in from a school library because libraries, the schools, often subscribe to large numbers of different journals so that if you're logging in from their login sites, from the actual school, uh, then you can get more um, items for free. Uh, and then other times you would have to ask for a loan. Like you would go to the uh, library here and say, I'm looking for this art article, and then the school could request it from our journal or request it from another school that subscribes to that particular one and you get this interlibrary loan. So there's different ways that you can get it that way. Um, and then sometimes uh, you can't get it unless you pay for it. Right? So there's lots of different ways that you can do it. But PubMed is the, the place to start. Um, you can just do just Google search PubMed and it'll take you to the PubMed site. It's easy. Uh, and then you can search anything. You can search key type, keywords or uh, you can search authors if you know a particular author. Like for example, if you have found a research article that works for you and you want to see the other things that that author has done, you can just put in that author and it'll give you a list of all the things that they have come up with. Um, so there's all kinds of different ways that you can do things uh, to gather the information that way. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, it's not okay when you're referencing to reference something that was referenced in something. Mm -hmm. So for example, if, <laughs> if you're reading an article in here, I don't know, so in here there's a statement on 
um, FMD and the occlusion cuffs that she's writing about. And she gives this big long information on FMD and then she's referencing Coretti uh, and others off that statement. It's not okay for you to read her paper and then also reference Coretti because you didn't get it from Coretti. You got it from her. Does that make sense? And if you need to have that specific information in your paper, you need to go to Coretti, make sure that you're interpreting it correctly, and then reference Coretti. Does that make sense? You reference physically what's in front of you. You can't reference something that was referenced within another paper, right? And especially if you're questioned on it. That's misinterpretation. Right? It, it is. Really especially if you're questioned on it. Um, okay, so you wrote this, and you said that Coretti said this, but um, what do you think about Coretti saying this? And you're going, well, I don't know, because I didn't read Coretti. I just read it in this paper. Right, so you have to reference properly as well. But if you are looking at an article, like say you're looking at articles on spine injury management and where spine injury management is going, and you notice that there's been some research on spine injury management, and you read this one article, and this article it's a it's a like a position stance paper from um, from the I don't know emergency room physicians of some sort, and you recognize that this information is really good, and you want to gather more information, you can go to those references and then go get the original research that went into their position stance paper. And that would be the appropriate way to do that. Does that make sense? Do you end up falling into a rabbit hole of following resources? Because like, if I read this paper here, and it says referenced this one, and you go to that one, and it says, they, well, they referenced yeah. this one, and you yes. fall into a reference rabbit hole? Yes. Uh, you may. And you may have to, right? Because it just depends on what it is that you're pulling and how deep that information is that you're trying to come up with before you can get to where you have to, where you have to go. So you can. Um, literature reviews take forever because you do have to kind of follow that down until you get to, okay, I can stop here. This information, they did original research. This information is what I can use. So you, you very well may because of referencing references all the way down the line. Yeah. You said position stance. Is that different than a research article? Yes. Okay, so I've talked about, so what you have in front of you is original research. A position stance, a position stance would be something related to an organization, um, like for example, uh, you might have a trauma surgeons association, or you might have the National Association of EMTs, or something to that effect, right? and they are putting out a position stance. And that's saying that they are saying, uh, they're saying this about a, particular, about a particular topic, whatever that topic is, right? So like for example, um, the American Medical Association might put out a position stance on the use of oxygen in a myocardial infarction. And they are saying we, as the AMA, are saying that we believe that this is how you should use oxygen when in context of, of a myocardial infarction patient. Does that make sense? And what that basically says is it says, this organization has looked over the research that's been applied to this particular topic, whatever it is, we've looked at everything, and now a decision has to be made. And we need something that can be concise that all of our members can read or all the public can read and say, this is how we are going to approach this because of the research that's been done. Not their research, but not their research. Interpreting others. They're, they, they're making a, a decision. A position stance is a decision-making process based on what has been done in the past. Does that make sense? Yeah. So on that topic, and maybe a segue, are we going to write a position paper or are we going to do like literature? Neither one. Uh, you'll be doing literature review for sure. Okay. Yes. And I'll, I'll tell you exactly how it's going to lay out in just a little bit. Does that make sense? So you might have a position stance paper, which is literally just an organization saying, this is how we um, believe that we're going to move forward with this information from this moment forward. Right? Um, so for example, the um, American Academy, uh, the ACSM, um, American... 
something sports medicine. I can't think, think of the C at the moment. They'll put out a, uh, a, a position stance paper on the use of fluid resuscitation in marathons. When you're the aid station that is supposed to be supplying the aid to marathon runners, this is what we believe about fluid resuscitation and hyponatremia and what you're going to do for that. And this is our position stance on it. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean that you have to follow. It just saying this is what ACSM, as a, as a resident expert organization on this information, is saying you should be doing for these particular athletes in this particular case. Does that make sense? So position stance papers are pretty important because they usually wrap up all the research that's being done and put it into a usable thing that says this is how we're moving forward in this context. So there's position stance papers on spine injury management, position stance papers on use of oxygen, position stance papers on how you're gonna deal with athletics, whatever the case is, right? Position stance paper on concussions in adolescence, right? How, when can a, when can, what tests are gonna be done and when can this athlete go back into play again, right? And if you go against those position stance papers, well, you better have a whole lot of reason for why you're doing it because that, it's not the standard of care, but it encompasses a major organization's view on the research and you better believe that's gonna come into litigation. So if you're going against a position stance paper related to spine injury management, boy, you're in a world of hurt, right? Because you just had a major organization of physicians say, this is what we believe you need to do in pre-hospital spine injury management, and if you don't do it, <coughs> you better have reasons for why you're not doing it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Do okay. they ever retract position stances? They don't ever retract, but they will have new position stance papers that come out based on new research that's come. So you'll, you'll see... <laughs> AHA um, refactors. Yeah, so you'll, yeah you'll, you'll see position stance papers on topics that are very similar as they go, as we get more and more information, or as- How do you know yours is the most current? Because you research it, and you look at dates, and you, the organization, the organization's pretty clear on the ones that they put out as the most current. You can still get all the old ones, all old position stance papers, but you pay attention to dates and research. Right, but like the most current ACLS protocol is from 2016. Correct. And that is the most recent one that's been put out. And they tell you and how you can shape. find that by going to AHA websites or looking up in circulation, which is the major journal of the Heart Association, and knowing that that's the most recent information that's available. Will they flag like former ones that they? Not in any way other than the organization that's putting out the position stance paper on like their websites will only put out the most recent position stance paper. And when you look it on like PubMed, that kind of thing. It'll be dated. Oh, the next question. You'll find position stances on PubMed as well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Any any of those you'll find. The other thing. Okay. So that's those are two examples. The other thing you'll often find is what's called a review article. A review article. And a review article is it's set up similarly in sections, but it doesn't have introduction, methods, results, discussion because they didn't do the research, so there's no methods and results. Okay? Or they might have a, a modified method section that basically talks about how they gathered the information for the review. But instead, what they'll have is they'll have different sections related to topics that they are reviewing. And what a review paper does is they will go, and review papers are good. They're a great way for you to gather um, a general understanding of a particular topic really fast. And so what the review article will do is it will go and take a whole bunch of original research articles on a particular topic, gather all that information, and then place it into one location, one review article that cites all of those different, all of those different original research papers. And a review article, the whole point of a review article is for, us, is for you to basically say, okay, there's been all of this different research on in and around this particular topic, and we've now collected it all and say, this is what all of the research says related to that particular topic, whatever the case is. So for example, you might have original research done on distracting injuries caused by cervical collars. And then you might have original research done on um, 
respiratory compromise due to the use of spider straps in spine injury management. And then you might have original research that's related to um, uh, muscular, muscular trauma in, the, in lower back, in the lumbar region, due to placement on a, on a long spine board for better than 20 minutes in spine injury management, right? And those are all independent research articles that are talking about all that. But then you might have a review paper that talks about spine injury management. And within that review paper, they reference every single one of those other ones and put it all into one concise location that says, cervical collars cause distracting injuries, uh, being on a long board for better than 20 minutes is causing this kind of injury. And then they'll have a section in their paper that interprets all of that collectively together into some interpretation. Is that different than a position stance then? Yes, because this is a singular author or group that is, it might be a university someplace that decides to do a review, and that's not a major organization that's providing a position. A position stance paper. Um, They're still reviewing a bunch of stuff too. Yeah, no, nobody, nobody cares about Corey's position on spine injury management. Yeah. But you might care about the National Association of ENT's yeah. position on spine yeah. injury management. Does that make sense? So you'd be doing a review paper potentially. Correct. But not necessarily a position of okay. an Position stance comes from an organization. Gotcha, gotcha. Right? So it's authored by somebody within their organization, but, but it comes, did a but it comes from a position. As the EMS coordinator for Lane Creek College, that's different in terms of a position statement. Like if you were trying to do Yes, but nobody cares about Lane Community College <laughs> position or anything either. But yes, that is the difference. Okay. Well, uh, your so students do. Yeah, or, you know, sort of yeah it, it would be like if I were if I were asked by the state of Oregon to do an author on how Oregon was going to have a position stance on, on something in OAR three three three, yeah. So then, your, and that'd be Georgia. your opinion. It's is, not my. It would be the state's opinion. Well, it would be your opinion represent or the, you would be representing the state's opinion. Correct. In that case. And they would be reviewing it and making sure. Yeah. Right. So position stances come out from organizations, major organizations of some sort. Does that make sense? You would be the author, but it's the position. It's but the position the, stances it's the of the organization. Of the That's correct. Okay. Good. Questions on just looking at that kind of stuff? So you're going to see this a lot. Like, for example, some of you probably on Facebook get gems mm -hmm. popping through things, right? Oh, I've got a good one. Okay, so GEMS is a, the, the Journal of EMS is not an original, typically, not an original research journal. It is a journal that they, um, the people that submit publications in GEMS, which are good publications most of the time, are writing um, reviews and information about what, they, um, what they've read about other things. It's not original research. And so when you read a GEMS article, you should not just outright trust everything that's said. That's not to say that it's not good information and that it's not trustworthy. That's not what I'm saying. But if you go out and, and they're saying in GEMS, they make a, some sort of a comment that says, you know, fire trucks should all be yellow and not red, right? Then in there, they should be referencing what research was done to suggest the fire trucks should be yellow and not red, right? Don't agree with that. Uh, it doesn't matter what you agree with. It doesn't matter what's been done, right? So, for example, fire trucks being red is the worst color on the face of this planet for an emergency vehicle because at night you can't see red. So they shouldn't be red, right? They should be reflective and white or some other color that's not red. That kind of stuff. But, but when you're when you're looking at when you're looking at an article in a, in a yeah. that's a tough topic. You should have brought that topic up. <laughs> when, you're, when you're looking at a when you're looking at a, a journal article, understand what the what the purpose of the journal is. So, for example, Gems. The purpose of that journal is to disseminate information quickly to a large mass of in individuals that are not going to be reading original research most of the time and to try to get some points across to them, right? Mm -hmm. So when you look at that, you don't typically reference a GEMS article, right? You, you go to the original research within that article that they came up with, 
when you're trying to reference the information that they're using in that article. Does that make sense? Okay, so understand when you read a journal, make sure you understand what the point of that particular journal is as well. Okay, and then the other thing that you look at is, um, so just take a look at Jenny's paper, the progesterone paper. Right, so you notice there's a variety of names over there. So uh, Jenny, Emily, uh, Mike, Vienna, Paul, John, and Chris are all the, the authors there. Jenny was the one that did all of the original research and she's the one that authored it. Um, Emily was actually an, ass an assistant, but she did a whole lot of work within the lab itself, so she was there almost every single day, but she didn't write a dime of anything that's listed there. Um, Mike Smith was also doing a whole lot of help within the lab, but he didn't contribute to anything that was actually written there. Um, Vienna is another one, but she actually contributed to a bunch of stuff that was there. Paul is an OBGYN who was the main doctor that um, did all of the screening on all of the patients and then uh, was there for every piece of the editing process. Uh, and then John uh, and Chris, Chris was the main advisor. As I said, he's the last author, so he was the main advisor. And John was another one that had a whole lot of input and um, came up with a lot of the techniques that were used in this particular article. Notice that after all of their names, there's a little number. All of them have the number one, but then there's Paul, who also has the number two after it. And those are our superscripts that tell you, in this case, where they're from. It's a good idea to just, at least for the first author, or maybe the first and last author, to look at where they're from, right? Because there's a difference if the lab that helped to do this particular research was, say, the University of Washington, versus one that was um, Olympia Community College in central Washington, or in Washington, western Washington, right? Because the, the place that it came from will also tell you the amount, the a level of training that is likely to have come from it. Uh, and sometimes you'll have an organization that is, has, it, it's like a for-profit place that has an agenda, that they're trying to push a certain type of an agenda, and that tells you that the, the data are gonna be skewed just a little bit because they're pushing a certain agenda, right? Um, so you really don't, for example, it's not a good idea to take research on, say, a new drug when the primary researcher is employed by the company who made the drug, right? Because of course they have an agenda with that drug. So that's not, that's not really good. <laughs> good. Uh, and you like to see uh, people that have funding. So in there, somewhere in there, it'll discuss where funding came from for that particular thing. And you like to see things like the National Institute of Health. You don't like to see things like physio control. Mm -hmm. Physio control. The company that makes your monitors. The company that makes monitors. Oh. Like if you, do a, if you do an EKG study or um, how monitors function in some fashion, right? You don't want it to be underwritten by a manufacturer of like EKG that. machines. Yeah, exactly. Because you can understand there's a conflict of interest there, right? You want it underwritten by some sort of, a, of an organization that is independent, right? So for example, a lot of, a lot of cardiovascular research is underwritten by the Heart Association, which is a good thing. Because the Heart Association, the whole point of the Heart Association is to get original research that helps them to determine better ways of taking care of cardiovascular research, right? But having, uh, but having it underwritten by the maker of, like, Bear, would not be a good place to get your funding from because there's a conflict of interest. The ASMA dose jumped to 600 <laughs> milligrams. <laughs> so I'm just saying, you, you just do a couple of things where you look, at, you look at the authors, you identify where they're from to make sure that where they're from is a legitimate place, and take a look at the funding sources to make sure that the funding is not somehow skewed, uh, which will definitely skew the results when it's all said and done, right? Because if they're getting funding from a certain place, they want to continue to get the funding from that certain place, which means they need to not necessarily be as truthful as they might have been had they not got their funding from that place. Which is how to skew perspective. 
Yeah. Does that make sense on how you look at, at these things? Questions? Okay. So, uh, what are you going to do in this process? Dun, dun, dun. And what are my goals for you while you're doing this? Um, well, part of my goal, for sure, is to get you to actually do a literature review and look at original research and just get used to, to doing that. Um, with my end game goal being that once you are a paramedic someplace out in the real world, that you will actually continue to look at original research things and make good decisions for yourself and then try to find nice, good political ways of helping to influence your agency towards the better decisions, <laughs> right? I mean, that's really what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. We, we would like people to use oxygen properly, to do proper spine injury management, to have better blood control methods, to find a way for patients to get out of the hospital neurologically attacked, intact, intact, and alive. Neurologically attacked. Right? So, so I'm, I'm hoping that you learn how to, to come out of this and still be able to look at things with a different type of eye. Um, secondly, would be for when you're actually reading something, because you do have continued education, you have to continue doing long after you're out of this class. Um, when you read something or a position stance or you read something in GEMS or you read an article here or there as part of your continued education, that you can pick up nuances pretty quick on whether or not that article actually has legitimacy or doesn't, or how to tell if the article has legitimacy or not. Um, if you haven't figured it out by now, just on Facebook, there's a lot of people that post a lot of things that look like legitimate things that really aren't. Right? They, they, really, they really don't know what they're talking about, but they pretend they do, or they present it as they do, and you can make anything look really cool and look like it's legitimate. So how do you tell for sure whether or not it's legitimate or not? Those are, those are important things. What's that? Yeah, yeah seriously. Because on Facebook it is. Or Reddit. Reddit's another really good right. wall, yeah. Avenue. Right? So, so those, are, those are a couple of underlying goals that I have, that I have for you. Uh, my, my next underlying goals and things that I'm getting from you guys are you're going to be presenting this information in a couple of different ways. You're going to be presenting it to your class. So getting, getting used to being in the public eye, even in that small way, and being able to present information in a coherent manner so that people can understand, and to a certain degree, to present an argument, because I am going to make you argue a little bit, to be able to present an argument and back up the argument with real data that you can say, no, this is what I believe, and this is why I believe it, and this is the data that backs that up. And then for you to have spent a little bit of time interpreting the data that you did find to make sure that it's reasonable and to help kind of identify how strong your data is, right? Because sometimes we have strong opinions with weak data, right? And you have to recognize when you have weak data and then you have to start thinking, okay, well then why do I have such a strong opinion of this particular thing? Other times, we have weak opinions or the opposite opinion of really strong data. And that's not the best place to be, <laughs> right? You wanna, you wanna be able to interpret data and come up with good results from that. And so that's a, a, another sidebar thing. And then at the very end of everything, I want you to be able to defend it to professionals. So we're gonna have, you're gonna be creating a poster that you will display uh, and we will be having other professionals outside of this class that will be coming in that you'll present in short bursts the information to and defend your answers to. And I'll explain exactly what that'll look like as we go. Good? Questions? <laughs> what are we doing this on? What are you doing it on? Like, what topic? Yeah. I can choose. show you topics in just a moment. To a certain degree, you get to choose your topic. To a certain degree. Okay. Good? Okay. Uh, when you do this, you can do this in teams of two. 
You cannot do it in teams of more than two. And can you do it completely by yourself? I'm okay if you do it completely by yourself also, if you really want to do it by yourself. Um, if you do it in teams of two, you're obviously graded equally on it. Uh, and if you do it as a single individual, it does not change the requirements or lessen the requirements at all. So uh, if you're doing it that way, you just you have to make sure that you're doing all the research by yourself, the gathering of it. If you do it in teams of two, um, you both have to be completely versed on the literature. So it can't be like one of you reads half the articles and one of you reads half the articles and then you find a way to put it into some sort of a paper uh, because you both have to be equally versed on everything that is discussed <laughs> within, the, within the confines of what you're writing. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, you will do uh, basically three different, three different ultimate things. One is going to be you're going to write a paper. You're going to write. Uh, um, you're going to write your paper in a good writing 121 slash writing 122 manner with grammar that is appropriate. <laughs> grammar that's appropriate. Citations that are done properly, and I'll I'll help you with guidelines on how to do this. Um, citations that are done properly, that kind of stuff. So it's going to be a decent article. And I'll tell you right now, if if the information that you gather, if you do a pretty dang good job of writing it, I'll even send it in for you to a journal. So you, there you go. So do a good job. That's beside the point, but uh, but that'll be one aspect. Second thing is that you'll have to um, orally discuss it. You will need to do, you'll need to be prepared and to do presentations. Um,